Today I'm gonna to talk about stress and how it relates to the bladder and the neurovisceral interactions, how the brain and, and other parts of the body are, are involved in, in pelvic pain syndromes. The goal of this talk is to, talk, is to discuss the role of environmental stress in lower urinary tract symptoms as well as in IC, uh, bladder pain syndrome talk about how the brain and the cortical networks uh, in stress processing, emotion, attention, and bladder function are related to each other, and discuss how we can model this in an animal model um, that we do in our laboratory, and we're studying this to see if we can find new uh, mechanisms and, uh, that will help us develop new treatment options for these patients. I <clears throat> want to discuss, um, um, one of the PIs um, is a joint uh, program in UCLA and USC, one of the PIs of the multidisciplinary approach for the study of chronic pelvic pain, where we're studying patients with interstitial cystitis, bladder pain syndrome, and um, both men and women, as well as men with chronic prostatitis. And it's a number of sites across the country, and we have pulled all these patients together. And some of the data that I'm going to present to you today have come from already eight years of being in the MAP uh, network. So if we look um, at the individual and we look how the, the pelvis, the, the bladder function, the spinal cord, the brain are related to each other, Part of the aims of the MAP was to really phenotype patients by looking at the neurobiology of the brain and structure of the brain and function, looking at other comorbidities, looking at epidemiology and symptoms, risk factors, psychological factors, biomarkers in, in urine, in, in um, saliva, uh, genotyping of some of these patients, looking at the microbiome, and see how all these things interact to really give us better understanding of who uh, these patients are, how these diseases um, developed, if there are subgroups of patients that are different from each other that might respond to therapy very differently from each other, and to give clini clinical tools um, to really better understand these patients and what are the uh, treatment alternatives for them. So more epidemiologically talking about what is published and what is available between stress and lower urinary tract symptoms in general, um, we know that patients with lower urinary tract symptoms, when you look at them and compare them to control, report um, be more likely having childhood um, traumatic experiences, um, having acute and chronic stress in their lives that are higher than in the general population, and they're more likely to have other psychiatric comorbidities. The exact association about, between these bladder symptoms and psychological traits are unknown, but I'm gonna try to go through this talk and try to show to you how what we call the micturition center and how it is modulated is so related to emotion and attention and how some of these things might be related to each other. Looking at over overactive bladder and IC, these patients have higher psychological stress level compared to healthy control as well. Some of this data has come from the MAP uh, um, study. Some of it has come from individual centers. Um, patients with overactive bladder have positive correlations between high stress level, anxiety, depression, and more severe incontinence. And there's been a couple of studies done in military personnel, both women and men, but uh, women with PTSD, uh, depression and anxiety are almost three times more likely to report overactive bladder symptoms and urinary frequency. The association between stress and IC I think is well known to us and to clinicians. <clears throat> we know that stress exacerbates symptoms. A lot of patients get flares, what they call flares, when they have um, high stressors in their lives. And we know that this is actually a dose-dependent um, uh, correlation. There's a high prevalence of psychiatric diagnosis in this patient population, levels of anxiety and depression, and levels of reported current and lifetime stress in these patients. There have been a few reports that have shown norepinephrine to be higher in patients with IC in the urinary uh, norepinephrine, kind of suggesting an increase in pathetic activity on tone in these patients. And chronic stress can exacerbate symptoms of both urgency and pain, as well as frequency. Patients report higher levels of lifetime stress. And there's some um, kind of interest now at this resilience to stress. Not only are there more stress, but how patients or individuals deal with stressors. There have been a number of personality traits that have been studying in the IC population. In the MAP study, patients with UCPPS have higher scores of negative emotionality and lower scores on extraversion compared to healthy controls. 
and neuroticism and low extroversion, at least in men with lower urinary tract symptoms, have been linked to both depression but also to worse bladder symptoms. Some of this might be genetic. There um, have been some, um, in some recent studies that have showed some uh, polymorphisms in particular genes in the beta-3 adrenal receptor, which is clearly uh, linked to sympathetic tone, that have been uh, linked to development of overactive bladder. There is a syndromic uh, defect in chromosome 13Q that leads to this pleiotropic syndrome that includes panic disorder, social anxiety, and IC that have been described in, in families of patients where many individuals are affected. And there are at least two SNPs that have been identified that are associated with panic disorder and IC bladder painful syndrome. So there's some genetic thought that there might be something in particular with these individuals. So what we see is that we can think of IC pain, uh, bladder painful syndrome in <clears throat> a slightly different way, not just a disease of the bladder, <clears throat> but that there are some individuals that have, might be vulnerable by genetics her, um, and, and heredity, that there might be some environmental factors that predispose them, as we saw with the military personnel and PTSD, that they, this can lead to bladder, bladder histopathologic changes and afferent sensitization that leads to central augmentation in the brain that has this loop that continues kind of feeding on each other. So that this, in this way, stressors in, the, in a particular vulnerable individual that has suffered particular um, um, environmental factors or exposed to environmental factors can have this upregulation of the pain response. So looking at it as a different paradigm, we think that there might be, as I just said, individuals that might be pain prone um, and that this might include gender, genetics, early life trauma, family history, chronic pain and mood disturbances, personal history of centrally mediated symptoms such as fatigue, depression, memory difficulties. Particular cognitions that are personality traits are really not very changeable, like catastrophizing, uh, and that they, this might all lead to lower mechanical pain thresholds. That then when these individuals are exposed, being a bad urinary tract infection, recurrent urinary tract infection, a local insult to a particular organ, they can have this over um, response um, and this psychological behavioral response to the pain and the stressor that leads to this chronic kind of maintenance of symptoms. So in this paradigm, the brain is much very associated with the bladder, with the afferents, the smooth muscle, the immune cells, and, the, and now we have known more and more about how the microbiota might be related both to the brain as well as to function. But where these um, changes in function and structure in the brain are mediated through the spinal cord can directly affect the periphery, and where peripheral um, uh, symptoms, peripheral insults, infections, trauma can also upregulate this whole system, kind of creating this cycle of maintenance of neuro, 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 neuronal changes, inflammation, and stress kind of being in that loop. Now, uh, when we look at what we call the Pontimetration Center, which here is says PMC, we can see the Pontimetration Center leads to sacral efferent output, and it's what we think about the, the voiding reflex, but it's highly associated and controlled with up and down uh, mechanisms to the thalamus, to the insula, to the periaqueductal gray, what is in the chart as PAG, and centers that really um, deal with emotion as well as uh, a stress and, and other mechanisms. And that sacral afferent input can also impact these centers. So what, and this is a slide um, kind of borrowed from a concept by Rita Valentino uh, in, at Penn. And some of the things this um, Barrington nucleus, which is part of the micturition center, is involved in this kind of whole network in the brain of attention and emotion, where um, acute effects can lead to attention and emotional arousals, and there's some reason why we need to shift our attention to be able to urinate. Um, uh, it, just normally. And then when this is altered, if somebody's exposed to chronic stress, this whole mechanism of attention and emotionality can be involved with our micturition uh, responses. What we see in the MAP network is that there are clear patterns of brain activation in UCPPS patients that differentiate them from controls. And this um, has been across the network and it's been a really exciting finding. But beyond these differences in patterns, we know that there's 
sensory motor regions that are here in this um, image shown in red that showed altered connectivity with region, the regions that are in yellow, and that this is greatest in patients endorsing pain during bladder filling, so that actually fullness of the bladder can alter these connections in the brain. This is a summary of pretty much all the brain findings, both structural MRI, diffuse MRI, as well as functional MRI, so looking at connections in the brain, not just areas of the brain that are different. And there's a number of, of findings in these centers that I discussed before, and I'm going to break them down for you a little bit. In um, a recent article uh, that was published in, in the journal Pain, we were able to separate these patients with um, IC and UCPPS in patients that had pel pelvic pain alone, more diffuse pain or really th diffuse pain all over the body. And interestingly, the brain signature of we can predict pretty much by the brain findings, which patients have only pelvic pain, have pelvic pain and beyond, which we call it, of really diffuse pain. So that we can see the phenotyping, the central response is really a crucial and it's really giving us a, lo a lot of information on how different these patients are from each other. And more recently, there's been a paper from the map also publishing that just with the brain signature, we can have predictors so at 12 months who's going to improve and who's not going to get better, depending on how those connections are in the brain. So we have tried to model this in the laboratory. And we actually take these rats that are genetically predisposed to stress and anxiety to try to model what these individuals are, are experiencing, and we stress them out. We put them in a little container, in a big container surrounded by water. Now rats can swim. This is not cruel. You just put them there. But that stresses them out enough. You put them there for an hour a day. And some of them we just handle, and some of them we put in this, what we call water avoidance stress. They try not to jump in the water. And then we do a bunch of testing on them. And we have published that these animals have bladder hyperalgesia. They have referred pain in the suprapubic region. They have pain with bladder filling. They have increased voiding frequency. They have tactile allodynia, which has also been shown in humans. They have increased colonic motility, and they are anxious. Um, so we test the referred bladder hyperalgesia by using this little um, kind of wires that are very fine that we put in the suprapubic area, and we see when the animals react by withdrawal, leaking, or jumping. And as you can see in this chart, the was is the red um, columns, and the animal, the controls are blue columns, and what you see in the X uh, axis is really uh, strength of these wires in the suprapubic region. So you can see that there's a very uh, dramatic difference in how these patients, uh, these patients, these animals experience discomfort in the suprapubic region. This um, here, and I don't know if we have a pointer, so I'm sorry, but um, reflects in the upper, in the upper line is the control line, and the lower one is the water avoidance stress animals. And these animals, this is a response to bladder distension. So not just pain in the pelvis, but really bladder distension. So we can distend them at different pressures, 0, 10, 20, 30, and 40. At 40, kind of maxed out, all animals get pain. And we can measure a surrogate of pain because we have transducers in the abdomen and we see how the animal contracts. So this is what this is measuring. So we re um, recently, at the end of last year, 2017, we published one of the first studies looking at brain responses in animals that have been exposed to stress, really kind of trying to, to replicate what we are doing in the map. So given the significant overlap of the brain circuits involved in stress, anxiety, and micturition, we evaluated the effect of chronic stress has on bladder function and regional brain activation during, during bladder filling. And what we found, so these animals all had distension of the bladder, and we distended it at 20 uh, centimeters of water, where a control animal will have no response at all, and a was uh, animal exposed to stress will have a response. And we saw a number of cortical regions that had greater activation, as well as subcortical regions, that really parallel some of the regions that we're seeing in the map in the humans. We also saw increased connectivity to the barrington nucleus, this is part of that uh, Ponting micturition center. Um, in these animals exposed to stress. And in this, this is kind of a schematic of what this network is. The Ponting Maturation Center and the uh, Periaqueductal Gray in the middle 
is involved in spinal cord and activation on the bladder leading to bladder contraction. And many of these areas that we're seeing in this animal model as well as in the humans are involved with uh, perception of fullness as well as urgency. So in conclusion, uh, from the animal protocol, the water avoidance stress animals have visceral hypersensitivity during bladder filling with increased engagement of portions of the micturition circuit. Uh, related to bladder fullness and urgency, bladder sensation, and it's related to motor regions coordinating bladder contraction. These results are consistent with the recent findings in ICBPS patients with increased brain activation in the full bladder state. The summary of this talk, uh, patients with ICBPS clearly report higher levels of lifetime stress. There's evidence that stress exacerbates their symptoms in these patients that is dose uh, response related. These patients have less resilience with negative emotionali emo emotionality, catastrophizing, and neuroticism that makes them less likely to be able to respond in a positive fashion or at least uh, cope with stressors. Our animal model has a high construct of validity to the human IC condition. And um, this environmental stress is susceptible individuals can lead to sustained urinary frequency and hyperalgesia of the bladder, which are similar to the findings we see in UCPPS. So in summary, on the left, uh, what we know from the map and the human studies is that there are these changes in these regions in the brain that can lead to this kind of phenotype of the bladder with frequency urgency pain in the middle. We don't know what happens first. You know, we have this, when we look at uh, patients that have already been diagnosed, we don't know if the bladder, if the brain abnormality happened first and led to the bladder abnormality, or if a bladder insult that is continuous can lead to this activation in the brain. What the animal models can help us is to know that without putting any insult in the bladder, by just giving a stressor to an animal that is predisposed to anxiety, we can replicate the exact finding that we have in humans leaving the bladder as a secondary kind of response to the brain. I want to acknowledge a bunch of collaborators, clearly um, all the members of the MAP, but um, I work closely with uh, UCLA, a member uh, Hall Schneider's lab that does a lot of the brain imaging at U USC, working closely with Lori Berger with some of the bladder uh, epithelial interactions, and I want to thank you.